Thank you very much. Uh, I am going to talk about low interest rates, but I am going to take a somewhat broader perspective on fiscal policy. Um, so just to give you an idea of where I'm going, and by the way, I should say I'm very happy to be uh, back at the European Central Bank. It's been a few years since my last visit, uh, and I've enjoyed the conference uh, very much so far. So back to my outline. Uh, I'm going to organize my uh, discussion in three parts, uh, starting with underlying economic uh, changes relating to demographics and technology. So sort of thinking about uh, fundamentals that are driving changes in the economy and how these cha economic changes uh, change the fiscal policy environment. And then uh, I'm going to talk about the implication at the end, talk about what the implications are for fiscal policy. So uh, the, it'll be a little bit complicated because everything's related to everything else and I've tried to sort of pull out different strands as I go along and I hope uh, uh, in the end I give you a, a complete picture of what I think of as the future of fiscal policy. So the underlying changes I'm going to focus on are three, population aging, economic integration, and economic inequality. I, you might say that, uh, that, these aren't, that, that aging may be a, a primitive or a fundamental uh, change, whereas economic integration and economic inequality themselves may follow from other underlying changes, but I'm not going to um, uh, worry too much about the semantics here, uh, and these are the sort of three fundamental uh, uh, types of uh, uh, changes that I'm going to talk about. And then in turn, I'm going to talk about how these changes contribute to, yes, low interest rates, um, but also uh, changes in the fiscal structure uh, of countries and also uh, an inducement of fiscal stress that many countries are or will be experiencing and then also fiscal spillovers and the interdependence of economies. So let me start with population aging, uh, which is uh, something that I've worked on over the years, uh, demographic change and its effect on fiscal policy. Uh, so perhaps I'm uh, uh, giving it more attention than others might, but I do think it's a very important issue uh, and it's certainly uh, important to all the countries we think about. Uh, so here's just a, uh, we saw, I think, a, a, a picture yet in one of the presentations yesterday about changes in old, old age dependency ratios. Uh, this is just a reassurance that uh, it's still true, true today. Uh, and uh, this is just the G7 uh, old age dependency ratios in 2018 and the projections uh, for 2050. Obviously differing for different countries. The United States uh, has, a relatively, has a higher birth rate and a higher rate of uh, Im immigration in migration than some other countries. Japan is a well-known uh, leader in population aging. It's the oldest population now among the major economies and it's going to get older faster than the other uh, countries. Uh, turning to selected countries from, the Euro from Europe, uh, including some of the ones I just showed you, you see it's, it's pervasive. It's bigger in Southern Europe, uh, Portugal, Spain, for example, Italy, all have very, very big uh, uh, current and increases in old age dependency. Uh, but it's a pervasive issue. Okay, so what? Uh, well, we know obviously that that has certain uh, economic effects in terms of uh, labor force participation and things like that. Um, but it's also got uh, direct fiscal implications. Uh, well, let me just, just uh, since I know the U.S. well, let me just give you an uh, illustration of this. This is a picture of U.S. federal spending since the 1960s, uh, going through uh, the last fiscal year in the U.S. 2018, uh, and it's the U.S. federal it's the federal budget uh, broken down into two pieces. And I've left interest I've left debt service out. I'll be talking about debt service uh, and interest uh, later. The uh, uh, non-interest spending, what you might say traditionally we thought of as what governments do. Uh, has been steadily declining uh, as a share of GDP in the U.S. Uh, you see a little spike up uh, in the, during the glo global financial crisis due to uh, counter-cyclical spending as well as a de decline in the denominator. Um, the, uh, 
uh, three major entitlement programs that are focused on the elderly, our public pension system, our Medicare, which is health care for the aged, and Medicaid, which is health care for the poor, but about uh, two-thirds of the spending goes to the aged because of things like uh, long-term care and other things that the elderly require. Uh, and you can see that uh, starting a few years ago, that, be, that those programs and those transfer programs um, became the majority of the federal budget together. Um, and that's just going in one direction, and I'm going to come back and talk about that. Um, well, associated with that is fiscal pressure, because it doesn't have to be that way, but it's, it is almost universally true that these kinds of age-based programs for the elderly are unfunded. One could certainly set money aside for public pensions, for uh, old age health care, uh, you know, on a generational basis. We don't do that. And for, with a stable population, it might not be that, that important, but with an unstable population, it's very important. So just to give you an illustration, here are uh, some fiscal gap calculations from a paper I did with Yuri Gorodnichenko for the Fed's Jackson Hole Conference two years ago. Um, by the way, you'll see there's a hyperlink. Uh, I've put hyperlinks to all the papers that I cite in uh, my slides. Uh, and so if, if, you, uh, want, if you access the slides, uh, you'll be able to access uh, anything that I cite in my talk. And for each of these, uh, I uh, provide uh, the, in the purple fiscal gap calculations, that is by how much would uh, the government uh, of that respective country, and this is for general government, including uh, subnational uh, governments, uh, by how much would it be necessary to increase the primary surplus as a share of GDP on a permanent basis between now and 2050 in order to maintain the current debt-to-GDP ratio? Uh, now, these calculations uh, are done assuming a 1% percentage point uh, gap uh, between R and G, so R greater than G. Uh, if you uh, assumed that R was equal to G or even less than G, that would reduce, obviously, re uh, reduce the numbers. Uh, but that isn't the major point of, uh, that I'm going to make. Um, that, is, that isn't relevant to the major point I'm going to make here. Uh, there are three bars for each country. The first bar is the all-in fiscal gap. The second bar, the green one, is uh, how big the fiscal gap is if you just uh, forgot about current government debt. Um, now, of course, if that there would be, if, if R were equal to G, uh, that would be no effect because current debt service to keep the debt to GDP ratio constant if R equals G uh, doesn't cost you anything uh, because you can just uh, 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 issue more debt uh, to service the existing debt if R equals G. Um, there's a, there's a, for most countries, a small decline. For countries like Italy, bigger because Italy has a higher debt to GDP ratio. But the, the big thing that I wanted to talk about in this, uh, in this picture is what happens when you go from the green bar to the red bar. Now, what's happening there is it's labeled no debt or P slash H. P is uh, pensions, H is health. And uh, the red bar says what would happen if the currently projected increases in health care spending and pension spending as a share of GDP didn't happen. And those values stayed at their current shares of GDP. And you can see how important these are uh, for all of the countries. Uh, much more important, even in this, uh, even under these assumptions, than uh, the current stock of national debt. Uh, and what that's showing is that the, uh, the fiscal problems and the fiscal stress that countries face is largely due to the increasing, the future increases in pension and healthcare spending. I should say all of these, uh, these are data come from IMF projections uh, at the time, two years ago. Um, there's also different flexibility and responsiveness. It's a lot easier to cut uh, discretionary spending than it is to have a pension reform that has immediate uh, impact on spending. So here is just as an illustration, this is from a paper I wrote for a Boston Fed conference 13 years ago, and I estimated uh, fiscal feedback rules uh, for the U.S. federal government for all discretionary spending, uh, discretionary spending excluding defense spending, uh, 
and then uh, those three programs that I showed you. Um, as a, just as a share of GDP uh, and uh, relating them to the lag value of the budget surplus uh, and the GDP gap. And you'd, you'd want positive coefficients for both of these uh, if the government is uh, practicing counter-cyclical policy and, um, and also worrying about uh, f the fiscal uh, picture. Um, and all the coefficients are positive. Um, but Social Security and Medicare and Medicaid, which I showed you now, are even more important at quantitatively. So their levels are even bigger now. And over this period, we're only a little bit smaller than uh, 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 all discretionary spending and bigger than non-defense discretionary spending, uh, is much less sensitive to those two uh, determinants. Uh, so it doesn't change uh, very much. And that's true in the U.S. I can't say what it's like in other countries, uh, but I know uh, how, given how uh, splendidly uh, the French attempt at pension reform is going right now, uh, that uh, these are difficult things to do. Um, particularly difficult to, it, uh, if, if you're interested in having a short-run impact on the budget. Um, there are also going to be different, uh, something that people don't think about as much, different, different trends in revenue sources. If we think of normal life cycle behavior, uh, as we shift to an older population, that's likely to make consumption taxes more important as a share of revenue uh, than income taxes, and that may have some impact on the automatic stabilization of, uh, uh, of taxes, simply because consumption being smoother than income uh, means that consumption taxes uh, for a given tax structure are likely to vary less with the cycle. <laughs> Um, another thing that, uh, that population aging is going to do is to contribute to slower economic growth. Well, that's obvious. Uh, slower, uh, we have, uh, as populations age, the labor force becomes smaller, labor force is growing less quickly. I mean, Japan is, again, a good example of this. And that, of course, that, that, that has one obvious implication that I think we all know, but pe sometimes people forget. Um, which is it? we need to adjust the norms we have for what normal economic growth is. Um, if we think of a certain growth rate as historically uh, you know, what we'd expect to see uh, for a well-functioning economy, that's not going to be true anymore if you're, if you're making a transition to an older population with a smaller labor force. But there is a more subtle uh, issue here, which is the composition of the labor force itself uh, may contribute to changes in the rate of labor productivity growth. Uh, and I just cite one paper here um, uh, a, a, a few years ago uh, in which, uh, looking across U.S. states, the researchers found uh, that shifts to an older uh, population within the workforce uh, contributed to lower rates of, uh, of growth. Uh, and if that's true, first of all, it would be worth figuring out why, because this is more, of a, more or less a reduced form analysis. Um, but it also has implications for what we strive to do in trying to uh, make the economy uh, perform well. And I think there's also a changing political equilibrium. Uh, one of the concerns I have, as somebody who worries about uh, the fiscal deficit in the US, uh, is that we are uh, rapidly losing our uh, it, whatever opportunity we have to make reforms of old age entitlement programs because the voting population is aging. Uh, and uh, people are likely to behave, behave in a self-interested manner, uh, and that makes it very difficult to pass reforms. Now, of course, you can finesse it uh, by holding harmless people above a certain age, um, but nevertheless, I think it means that uh, it, uh, reforms of these kinds of programs uh, will get more difficult even as it gets, uh, as the reforms become more essential. And I just cited a paper here by Jim Paterba looking again across U.S. states um, at uh, education spending and showing that education spending was negatively affected by the elderly share in the population. Um, so I think that means that uh, the time, it, there's, there's some, um, uh, uh, Time is of the essence, I guess I would say, in dealing with uh, the fiscal stress associated with uh, unsustainable uh, uh, old age entitlement programs. And of course, one final thing it, uh, that 
uh, demographic change is likely to do is have an effect on the capital labor ratio. Again, using our standard life cycle analysis, and that uh, has, is one of the causes that's been implicated, along with others that were mentioned yesterday, uh, in contributing to lower interest rates. The second uh, economic change I'm talking about is economic integration. Um, we always think about e economic in integration as uh, sort of trade as a share of GDP, and here for the G7 and, and the, in, in the dark line, the average, unweighted average, uh, is the um, basically half, you know, average of exports and imports as a share of GDP, <laughs> rising steadily through this period uh, as, we, as we know. Uh, no, no surprise there. That's what people think about when they think about economic integration, uh, but there's another aspect of ec economic integration that I think is important, um, which is the rise of multinational companies. So not simply trade, um, but you might say supply chains, and the fact that companies are operating uh, in many places. So this is, uh, just as an illustration, uh, for U.S. resident companies, the share of their profits coming from foreign sources. Uh, and you can see how steadily it's been going up, of course, w with wiggles, but it's, it's an uh, uh, inexorable <laughs> upward trend uh, as companies uh, have become multinational companies. So they don't simply export uh, or import, um, they operate around the world. And uh, the effects of these two different aspects of immigration, uh, of integration, well, the fir first is just larger f fiscal spillovers. I I've cited a paper that my colleague and frequent co-author Yuri Gorodnichenko and I did using OECD data estimating pretty large fiscal uh, spillovers uh, within the OECD um, based on trade uh, linkages. Um, but on, as to the multinationals, uh, increased tax competition. You know, it, if, co if companies are operating around the world, it makes it easier for them to move their activities among countries and uh, to move their profits, or at least where they report their profits among countries. Um, and this has led to very sharp declines in uh, corporate tax rates. Here, this is for the G7, but the G7 are representative of uh, a broader group of countries. Uh, the United States being the most recent country to adopt a, a sharp decline in its corporate tax rate. Uh, but surely not the last. Uh, and that I increased tax competition is uh, hastened uh, by another economic change, which is the, sh the shift of production toward intangible investment and services, especially digital, because these are things that essentially have no home. Uh, uh, companies that use uh, intellectual property to produce or produce digital services, uh, it's in the cloud somewhere. You can't say it's in Germany or it's in Ireland or it's in the United States. And that, of course, uh, makes countries even more, uh, 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 feel even, it even more necessary to compete um, or, or, or adopt policies uh, to deal with it. The third economic factor I'm talk I wanted to talk about is economic inequality. This is from uh, the uh, World Inequality Database. Uh, something that uh, Thomas Piketty, Emmanuel Saez, and others have put together, and we all know what the story is here. Um, let me just issue a little bit of a warning about this. First of all, uh, aggregating across cohorts in measuring inequality, even in a stable population, um, can lead to in a certain uh, uh, misleading conclusions. Uh, just for example, this is from a paper I did um, most uh, just finished a few months ago with uh, uh, Larry Kotlikoff and Daryl Kohler, uh, where we showed that if you look over a lifetime basis and separate by cohort, uh, the U.S. tax system and transfer system looks a lot more uh, progressive than a, a adding than it would look if you just look at a single year and add all cohorts together. And these are uh, effective tax rates, negative at the bottom of the uh, of the resource distribution because. Uh, poor people are basically getting transfer payments rather than paying taxes. Um, but with demographic change, there's an additional element of uh, the problem uh, of measuring inequality, uh, which is that the changing age structure may induce spurious changes in measured inequality. Just to, as an illustration, um, typical ways of measuring re, uh, resources would look at current income. 
If you have retired individuals, retired individuals are likely not to have very much current income, even if on a lifetime basis they're at relatively affluent. And so an increase in the elderly share of the population might uh, cause you to think that there's more inequality, more, more mass at the bottom of the income distribution, when in fact no such thing is happening. Um, and also, if we're looking at trends, the trends may differ within cohorts. We may, may have different trends among 50-year-olds and among 20-year-olds, and, and if we're trying to understand what the future is going to look like, we want to understand these differences. And finally, and I'll come back to this when I talk about, uh, uh, about the implications, um, inequality across cohorts uh, is an important issue for fiscal policy. If you think about the demonstrations uh, so going on right now associated with global warming, for example, it's very much a generational issue. Um, and many other things, when we think about fiscal reforms, are going to have very uh, potentially very strong generational consequences. Um, and if we don't think about those when we're thinking about fiscal policy, um, we, we are going to be missing perhaps a potentially big piece. Um, what are the potential impacts on fiscal policy of inequality? Um, perhaps this is more true in the U.S. now than, than in other countries. But the, a, a push to rely more on uh, tax bases that are associated with the wealthy uh, corporate taxes, wealth taxes, some things which may not be as easy to collect as uh, tried and true uh, taxes like a VAT. And a stronger reliance on more volatile sources of revenue uh, if we think of taxes on corporate profits and high incomes. So this is just an illustration. This is for the U.S. These are the uh, sort of growth rates starting from uh, um, 1980 uh, for different uh, 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 parts of the population. And the incomes of the top 1% uh, are much more volatile than incomes lower in the income distribution, simply because a lot of it comes from corporate profits. And corporate profits, in turn, are, are quite cyclical, too. You can see they fall as sharply as a share of GDP uh, during recessions. Now, uh, you might think that would lead to and a strengthening of automatic stabilizers because we're relying more heavily on taxes on these very volatile sources. But then I think you need to think also about marginal propensities to consume and whether uh, they might be lower at the top of the income distribution um, than they are uh, in other parts uh, of the income distribution. I've just cited here a paper by my uh, former student, Owen Zadar, uh, which find, in the JPE, which finds that to be true. I think another thing that inequality is going to do is uh, put political, it, it'll exert political pressure not to cut spending. I think it, it's, if one thinks of spending programs as disproportionately helping uh, the less well-off in the population, having a, a more unequal distribution of income is going to make, uh, it, increase the political challenge of, of reducing spending. And I'll just, as a, as a note, I showed you some fiscal feedback rules earlier that I estimated in a 2006 paper. Um, I've continued to estimate these using uh, diff different data sources uh, uh, and most, most often using semi-annual data from the Congressional Budget Office on tax and spending changes. And uh, over the years, the, the, uh, these feedback rules have tended to look sort of like the ones I showed you before. Uh, showing both taxes and spending responding to the fiscal gap and to uh, the budget surplus. Uh, for the last 10 years, those equations just break down for the U.S. Uh, there's basically no relationship, or if there's any relationship, it has the wrong sign with respect to the, the budget. Um, the uh, best illustration of this, I think, is what the U.S. has done in the last couple of years. In 2017, at full employment with a growing budget deficit, we had an enormous tax cut. Um, the following year, we had very big spending increases. Um, not called for by the state of the business cycle, and certainly not called for by the state of the budget. Um, whether that's due to the uh, you know, inequality and the, the stress that that puts on the political process or some other factors, I can't say. Okay, 
So this brings me to the third part of my analysis or my, my talk, which is what the implications for all of these uh, things are for fiscal policy. So first, and now I will uh, take up some of the issues that Olivier Blanchard talked about yesterday, um, how does one respond to low interest rates? So I said that low interest rates were in part a, f a phenomenon caused by uh, aging. Others have mentioned secular stagnation, which I suppose could be related to aging. Um, they've also talked about a shortage of safe assets. Uh, it matters why interest rates are low when we think about how to respond. If it's a savings glut, for example, because of demographic change, um, that has uh, different implications for what op possible rates of return are in the private sector than a shortage of safe assets. A shortage of safe assets would suggest a, a bigger spread between the return on government debt and the return on private investment, um, whereas the savings glut would just suggest all rates of return are lower because there's more, you know, there's a lot of capital floating around. Um, and the different implications, uh, I think an important uh, difference has to do with um, whether it's uh, what you should do with additional government debt if you issue it. Um, if, if you've got a shortage of safe assets, but that means you may have a lot of very high uh, invest good investment opportunities in both the private and the public sector, which means issuing government debt may be a good idea, but not necessarily increasing the government's net liability position. So in, in, issuing government debt to invest in government capital, uh, which is something Olivier suggested yesterday, or in private capital for that matter. Now, I realize there are um, agency issues, there, there are a variety of issues one wants to think about before recommending that the government uh, issue bonds uh, to invest in private securities. Um, but, you know, we, we have a precedent for this in the U.S. anyway uh, that came during the financial crisis when the Fed was buying uh, uh, mortgage-backed assets. Um, now, that was a different circumstance and for a different reason. Um, but I don't think one should necessarily rule out the idea of making funds available for private investment uh, if issuing government bonds has some specific value. Now, I also want to issue some caution um, uh, regarding the message you heard yesterday about uh, the, uh, pa how painless it would be to issue additional government debt. Um, and the main problem is that uh, that analysis sort of tends to think about a situation where you've got, say, a zero primary deficit and you, you, know, you, you issue debt and, you know, is it sustainable? Um, but that's not the situation that the U.S. or European countries face because of this age-based spending growth that I was telling you about. So let me give you some current uh, projections for the United States. Um, and my apologies, I pulled these out of a, a PDF file, and so I um, uh, didn't. Uh, the the uh, legends are too small; they're uh, too small to be uh, really readable. Um, but these are from a paper I did with Bill Gale in uh, in September, uh, and these show the composition of U.S. federal government spending over the next 30 years, as projected by the Congressional Budget Office and with some adjustments by, uh, by us uh, to provide a more realistic picture of what current policy is. The problem in the U.S. is that a lot of uh, policies that are currently in place are scheduled to expire for really parliamentary budget reasons uh, that have nothing to do with what the government's actually doing. Um, and so these are, uh, you might say, realistic projections of where we're going. And you can see um, that, and these are, by the way, since these are very recent projections, these are assuming very low interest rates on government debt. So these, these are current uh, projections given current interest rates. So these are not overstating our current uh, estimates of interest cost. And you'll see net interest going steadily up um, to the point where it'll be, uh, uh, you know, several percent of, uh, of GDP. Um, by the end of the period, uh, unprecedented a share of GDP. And the reason for that is that health care spending and Social Security, which in the U.S. is public pension spending, uh, 
um, are rising, especially healthcare. Um, and these are not uh, pessimistic projections. These are, uh, you might say, the central tendencies of these distributions. In fact, perhaps uh, optimistic in the case of uh, the, the Social Security public pension spending. Um, and what these translate into uh, is the dark line uh, current policy. Current law is this unrealistic uh, uh, scenario where a lot of these provisions expire. So current policy is the one to pay attention to, starting from our current net debt to GDP, publicly held debt to GDP ratio of just below 80%, uh, to um, uh, 180% um, by, the, uh, by the end of the uh, uh, three decades. Uh, who knows what's sustainable? Um, but this, uh, since the U.S. Is, is, uh, has a post-war, has a high, uh, since World War II of 106% of GDP uh, publicly held. And that was in 1946 at the end of World War II for obvious reasons. Um, so going way past that, uh, it does put us in uncharted territory, although possibly something that we can uh, live with for a long time. Um, fine, uh, another point I want to make, uh, and it's sort of implicit in what I just showed you, which is that low interest rates don't uh, keep the debt from accumulating if, the, uh, you know, if you keep throwing primary surpluses on. There are particular problems if you think of uh, unfunded programs. If, if your aim is to fund these programs, low interest rates actually hurt. They don't help. And I'll give you as an illustration uh, one of our big uh, growing fiscal problems in the United States, which is our unfunded state and local public pension liabilities, basically for state, state and local employees. Uh, these are largely unfunded. They have funds, but they're not obliged by law to be funded. Uh, and over time, the discount rates uh, that the pension plans themselves apply in trying to calculate their unfunded liability, um, uh, but national income accounts at, at the Bureau of Economic Analysis uh, also uh, have been uh, re reducing their uh, uh, assumed discount rate for these plans, uh, basically tracking our, the, the uh, high-grade corporate bonds. Um, if you look at what's happened, and th these, these are from recent uh, data from the Bureau of Economic Analysis. So here's the funding ratio uh, for uh, two states in the U.S. plus the U.S. average. Uh, and very little has happened during this time um, th th there haven't really been any changes in what governments are doing. Uh, and you see that uh, since the early 2000s, there's been a decline in the funding ratios of these public pension plans. Um, and uh, it's well known in the U.S. now that Illinois is not a good place to live if you don't want to pay for future pension liabilities. Uh, Wisconsin, which is near Illinois, but uh, I guess uh, different for a variety of reasons, is much better. Um, but you can see that going from a position where the funding ratio was close to 80% for the U.S., we're now below 50%. Um, and that's, that's a remarkable change, and it's largely attributable to a decline in, in interest rates. So if, you, if you're thinking that, uh, that uh, the fiscal problem is one of current liabilities, then low interest rates are good. If you're thinking that the fiscal problem is one of future primary de deficits, then low interest rates either don't help you at all if you're not trying to fund them, or hurt you if you're trying to uh, de uh, accumulate a reserve fund to help cover those costs. And finally, I'd like to point out that while we focus on, on the difference between the rate of return uh, and the growth rate, um, the growth rate itself matters. So just imagine a government uh, trying to keep its debt GDP ratio from getting too high. Um, when is it going to get too high? It's going to get too high, other things being equal, during a period of disappointing economic growth, either because of recession or slow productivity growth. And that's going to be the time that the government is likely to need to uh, and have a fiscal consolidation. It's also going to be a time or a state of nature in which in incomes are lower. If you have a period of prolonged slow growth or many recessions, 
uh, you'll be poorer than in other states of the world. And so that needs to be taken into account. If you, it's not simply doing a stress test and saying, what's the probability that we're going to need to make an adjustment? That is certainly, uh, it, it, you, you need that information. But when that adjustment is made, resources are gonna be very valuable. Um, and so you need to have a risk adjustment for that. And that's something that, that we typically don't do. Um, and finally, uh, and an obvious point that's uh, already been made, um, is at this conference, uh, we need more um, uh, robust uh, uh, options for fiscal policy, uh, given the uh, limited scope for monetary policy when interest rates are quite low. Okay, what's the, uh, uh, the implications for fiscal policy in responding to uh, fiscal stress? Um, we need to have a greater focus on longer-term spending. And for that, budget rules don't do well. Um, now, I, I understand that the, the budget rules in, uh, that the e, uh, EU has uh, have special provisions for pension reforms uh, to try to uh, prevent uh, the rules from standing in the way of pension reform. Nevertheless, it's very hard to write rules. And here I'm very much uh, in line with what Olivier was talking about yesterday when he was talking about rules versus standards. Um, the, the, the kind of adjustments that we're gonna want governments to make are gonna be more complicated to describe than simply changes in deficits. Um, and we're also gonna to wanna to have additional information such as generational effects. Uh, a point that I made earlier. If we're talking about having a pension reform, there are many ways to reform pensions. You can do it through increasing contributions. You can do it through cutting benefits. You can phase in benefit cuts. You can adopt them immediately. You might have very similar budgetary effects over, on average over a period of time and very, very different effects on different cohorts in the population. And so if that is an element of social welfare uh, that you think is relevant, uh, you need to have measures of when you're evaluating the performance of governments and meeting fiscal targets that incorporate uh, generational measures of generational impact. That's more complicated still than what budget rules do and I think it just moves you further away. Um, and and I, I say here in a vague sense that it, it suggests greater reliance on fiscal institutions and less on fiscal rules. And whether those fiscal institutions are fiscal councils or some other uh, entities um, I, or bodies, I think that's really the only way to go because the rules are simply cannot be written in a way that, um, that deals with all the contingencies that have to be taken into account. Um, at the same time that we want this more complex uh, focus on the longer term, we want to have, be a little bit more relaxed about the short term um, because of low interest rates, um, both because that lowers the short term costs of increasing debt and also because low interest rates limit the scope for monetary policy. And again, that's another argument against the, the way we apply budget rules, which tend to focus more on the short term, at least in terms of specific measures. Um, and I think also we need to think about um, stable and growing revenue sources. Uh, to whatever extent we have pension reform or healthcare reform, we also need to think about additional revenue sources. Uh, for countries like uh, uh, those in the EU, the VA, increasing the VAT may be an, an option. Uh, for countries like the US, adopting a VAT, moving in the direction of destination-based business taxation. Some other taxes that are more stable uh, and viable in light of the uh, increase in globalization uh, of, of companies. Um, also, in light of the political friction that we observe, perhaps because of inequality or perhaps because of other reasons, I think it's important to consider changes both for the long run and for the short run um, that have a more, are auto, more automatic in character. So for the short run, that means trying to strengthen automatic stabilizers, putting things into law either that 
for example, have automatic adjustments in the VAT uh, in response to uh, economic weakness. And for the long term, because of the difficulty of dealing with um, uh, unstable, uh, un uh, infeasible uh, pension or health care pro uh, programs, some sort of automatic adjustments. For pensions, it's easier to talk about um, age indexing for the old age dependency ratio, which I know is something that is in place in Germany, notional defined contribution accounts uh, for public pension systems that automatically adjust a pension uh, uh, accumulations or entitlements uh, for life expectancy. Having these things as part of the law, I think, um, makes it easier to stay on a good trajectory um, because it doesn't require uh, uh, frequent political intervention uh, when such intervention may be problematic. And finally, in terms of uh, implications for fiscal policy uh, in the, because of economic spillovers, I don't have much to say here except uh, a couple of things. I think we need additional research. We have estimates of spillovers of government spending. Logically, given what we would expect to happen, these uh, spillovers should be different for different kinds of spending um, because of import shares. Leak leakages should be different. Um, and more research to know what the strength of these spillovers of different kinds of spending and tax changes are would be useful. Um, and if one is thinking about budget rules, um, I've been speaking against budget rules um, as, as, as being increasingly uh, difficult to use to deal with the fiscal problems that countries face. But to the extent that, uh, say, the EU continues to, to utilize budget rules, having uh, budget rules and norms that depend not only on a country's own situation, but on a, an aggregate situation, I think would be useful. Um, the, one can get into the, the discussion of whether that will be enough, whether countries um, will, that, uh, that could, could, that have fiscal space and could uh, help other countries would be willing to do so. Uh, even with a weaker budget rule, that is a, that is a relevant question. Um, but I do, I do think that taking sp spillovers into account, um, one can think about uh, how rules might be different um, and, and based not only on a country's own situation. So let me conclude. Uh, I think that um, fiscal policy uh, is, be is becoming more important. It's becoming more important because monetary policy is becoming less effective because of low interest rates. Uh, and it's becoming more important also um, because we're going to need fiscal adjustments uh, to uh, make uh, our current uh, path feasible and to deal with the inequality and other social problems that we have. Um, these point to uh, a great, perhaps a greater tolerance uh, for deviations from a standard trajectory in the short run, uh, but also less tolerance and more focus on longer-term problems uh, than we traditionally ap apply when thinking about uh, budget rules. Uh, the, um, the, the reforms are needed everywhere. We need to reform tax systems to make them perhaps more cyclically responsive, fairer, and more sustainable uh, in light of globalization. Um, we need to reform age-based spending programs. Um, we need to change our budget rules and perhaps rely more heavily on inst uh, fiscal inst uh, different kinds of institutions. They're all needed. I've pointed out some of the changes that could be made, but in many cases, I've simply said that the way we do things now is not adequate. Um, so I'm not really saying that we necessarily need more study uh, or more research, but we definitely need more thought uh, and perhaps more experimentation uh, to see what works. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Alan. Perhaps I can I would uh, lead, leave these uh, conclusions up so we can, can be a bit of a guide to the discussions. So let me open the floor for uh, for a few questions, please. So I would like to go back to your uh, point 
on the funding ratios of the states in the US, uh, because I think it's sort of uh, relevant for Europe. A lot of the states have balanced budget requirements. Right. So, so what is it going to happen when you know, the aging is going to kick in and there is a recession? I think this sort of tells us maybe what is going to happen here because we have these rules, etc. Let's go let maybe three, uh, was Gabriele was there? Uh, yes, Gabriel Giudice from the Commission. Um, uh, first of all, I wanted to underline uh, your initial point, which is uh, that perhaps the interest rates uh, are not exogenous and perhaps something can be done. And uh, perhaps you can elaborate more on how do you think this, uh, the role of uh, government, government bond markets actually can affect it. You came with one solution, making more. Uh, but, you know, if you can elaborate on that, because it might recreate more room for policy, monetary policy, actually, rather than just going into the discussion of fiscal. And the second point I had, uh, you mentioned new forms of taxation or shift in taxation, and you didn't mention one tax which, in my view, is uh, satisfying all the criteria you mentioned, which is property tax. And so if you can elaborate on that as well. Thank you. Yeah, that was a question, please. Yeah. Hi, I'm Phil Porter from the ECB. Um, goes in the same direction as Gabriel's question. Uh, with the design and effectiveness of monetary policy and all the challenges for fiscal policy, what change do you foresee for the actions of, of and the, the working of central banks? You know, will we be conducting mostly a policy mix? Uh, we don't have strong institutions on the fiscal side. We don't have strong fiscal councils that you are calling for. Ministries of Finance are usually very oriented on the short term. So what will be the new structure of policy making? Let's go to another couple and then we, we, we maybe we'll do another round. So add two, add two here, please. Okay. Paolo Borriel from the Banco de España. Um, what you've been talking about is what um, some people have been termed as a social dominance and the public spending, and uh, I think we're not paying enough attention to it. And often we, we say things like, for example, you know, politicians are forgetting about public investment. Often it's not that they're forgetting about it, it's just the social dominance of the health and, and the aging is just pushing that out of the picture. Right. And uh, how to rebalance this, I think is not simple, because the political economy of it is, is very, very complex. Especially because we are, what we are seeing is that it's not only the old that are calling for the social dominance. In fact, it's even the young who are calling. You know, we have young people demonstrating in favor of pension systems when they're the most damaged by, by, by them. So how we bring this political economy of the social dominance into the fiscal uh, debate, even in the short run, I think is fundamental. And uh, we'd like to have you know, ideas about how to bring this more structurally into, into, into our models and our analysis. Thank you. OK, let's go for Vitor, and then we stop. Uh, I, I, I really enjoyed your presentation. You cover so much ground that I would like to have details on tons of things. So let me just focus on a couple. If you were to uh, kind of go to 2050, and given all the challenges that you have outlined, how would you see the structure of national tax systems and the international tax system in 2050? Okay, let's. So let's address this first round, and maybe there will be a second round. All right. Um, so um, it, there, I'll try to group questions. Um, so there, the first question was about what, what will happen to the, um, the states um, when they get old and have all these commitments and the balanced budget. And I had a question about the dominance of social spending and, and how, you know, how do we make room for public investment. Um, uh, I don't know. Um, the, um, uh, you know, as people have are in the U.S. Have, uh, at the low state and local level have confronted uh, in many of these cities uh, with aging populations and large public workforces have confronted their situation. Um, they, uh, it's very, very uh, uh, gloomy prospects where they're, you know, they're anticipating that their entire budget uh, will go toward uh, servicing um, old age pension um, uh, commitments. Uh, 
Um, and indeed, in the US, we have constitutional restrictions that keep us from adjusting um, these, these, these things, even worse than at the federal level. Um, and to the extent that this is true in other countries and that there's general lobbying for um, bigger pensions, um, there's lobbying in the current U.S. political uh, uh, environment. There's proposals to expand our pu public pension system right now. Uh, I don't have an answer. Um, my expectation is that um, we, there may, it may require uh, some sort of a fiscal crisis, um, whether it's at the state and local level or at the national level, uh, for there to be any kind of sustained uh, reform uh, programs to put social programs to put them on a sustainable basis and leave enough room for necessary public investment um, but I don't I don't have a roadmap for how that's going to happen um, because the the politics of that uh, is uh, are very difficult um, the um, role of the government in affecting interest rates yes I, I suggested that if safe assets is what the investing public wants, then safe assets is what governments should supply. And obviously, if the government supplies a lot of them, that's going to affect the interest rates on those. Um, that's what we'd expect to happen. But um, nevertheless, if uh, governments can do that um, and use the money for, for productive investment, um, I think that's a good thing. Um, what um, element, who, which entity in the government should do that? Um, and indeed, whether that's something that um, you know, uh, in terms of the question of what should central banks do, that's a pretty big expansion of what central banks do. But as I said, um, our central bank in the United States did that uh, during the financial crisis. Um, and so indeed, uh, that kind of portfolio management, it's a step beyond quantitative easing or balance sheet expansion, um, but certainly something that one can think about as an expanded role for central banks, because after all, it does relate to, um, uh, to uh, attempts to adjust or control the interest rate. Um, what the um, national tax, tax structure will look like in 2050, and I guess this relates to the question about property taxes, um, I, I, I think uh, one should not hold up too much hope for international cooperation, um, which means that uh, countries are going to need to find tax bases um, that serve reasonably well in terms of equity and uh, are not as subject to uh, disappearance uh, as some of the bases that they rely on now. Uh, you know, it was right when Henry George said it, and it's still right, that uh, property taxes uh, have appealing features. Uh, it is a puzzle uh, that we don't rely more on them. It's not a puzzle in the United States because it's, un it's un probably unconstitutional for the U.S. federal government to impose property taxes. Um, but that's not a problem that other, other countries have. Um, and it, it's, it actually does puzzle me that, um, that property taxes aren't more important. I did mention destination-based taxes. Um, people are a, le a lot less mobile than, um, consumers are a lot less mobile than um, electrons. Um, or in the case of digital services, uh, or patents, or um, re reported profits. And so um, trying to tax um, either consumption or other bases like uh, corporate profits on a destination basis that is related to where consumers are, I think, is, is the direction in which we're already heading, and I think we're going to keep going that way. Um, so I think, I think that's... It, there, there is a feasible path for tax systems, um, but I think it's taking us a while to figure that out. Any further question from the audience? Yeah, please, uh, Christoph. Oh, oh, no. yeah, yeah. Okay, so the way, one back and then we come here. Oh, yeah, thank please. you. Uh, Lucio Bank, European Commission. Um, I would ask you to elaborate a bit more on the long-term dimension of fiscal policy, specifically along the following. I think uh, it's fairly your recommendation on stronger short-run fiscal policy response is fairly consensual from what also we have heard throughout uh, this conference. Uh, 
Likewise, although difficult to implement, the need for more long-term approach to things such as pension, and actually I think in Europe to some extent this has been following having automatic indexation rule. And uh, mm -hmm. My point is related to the issue of funding, in that you started by saying, okay, program could be funded and unfunded, most, of them, most are unfunded. But then actually when you're showing the data for the US states said, well, with very low interest rate, it's not that funding is so much of a viable strategy, which to me points to the fundamental issues that short of storing food in the ground, the consumption of the old will have to be paid for by the productive capacity that is there. So do you see a role for fiscal policy in this respect, if this is in a sense is the fundamental problem long term wise? Um, thank you very much for the uh, very inspiring talk. I would have one question uh, which is a bit related to what Vitor said, like if we look forward 30 years, um, how will the world look like? So in a sense, is Japan giving us a glimpse where we are headed? So will we see very large debt ratios throughout the world? Um, will we see, in a sense, permanently low interest rates, permanently low Inflation, I mean, you also talked about the breakdown of uh, the fiscal rules that were estimated before the crisis. So how we had it in this world that is described also by those who believe in the fiscal theory of the price level, we are in a fiscal dominance regime and, and we may be stuck in there for a long time. Yeah, please. I was just puzzled by something you said, and I hope you can clarify. You made a comment about uh, that the federal government can't tax property, and yet we have all of these presidential candidates, sorry, this is US specific, but it's intriguing, calling for a wealth tax. And I don't know how we would have a wealth tax if a huge chunk of our wealth is in our property. Any further? I need to know for personal reasons. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Jacopo? Um, Jacopo Cimadomo from uh, DCB. I was uh, a bit, uh, of course, uh, um, I mean, surprised and uh, struck by your um, uh, chart of inequality. I mean, you showed the uh, big increase of uh, income held by the top 1% of uh, population in the US. On the other end, you showed that um, contrary to what we might have expected, taxation is very progressive in the US, or at least uh, mm -hmm. there is some degrees of progressivity. So the question is uh, then uh, uh, why we still see such a big degree of uh, uh, inequality. Uh, is this due to tax avoidance or to uh, um, profit shifting, for example? Uh, a reason uh, seems to me also the increase in income that you showed in, an, in, another, in an, another chart. Uh, from a policy point of view, what uh, can we do? I mean, wealth tax is an option. Um, Another option could be to increase further the progressivity of, of taxation, and is this something feasible in the U.S. or not? Thanks. Sure. Any further remark? I mean, I, I will perhaps uh, as, as a last uh, question myself. Um, sure. I mean, you, you, you argue for basically, um, if I understood you correctly, you argue for, for more fiscal activism when, the, when we are at zero bound. Mm -hmm. Uh, so how do you, how, how how should one interpret this? I mean, uh, uh, so I, I, of course I see the rationale of that. Uh, uh, I mean, on the other hand, I mean there is there is evidence at least for the U.S. I mean there is a paper by Gali and others uh, showing that the economy has been behaving during the zero bound exactly as in the in the in the period without the zero bound. So in other words, it seems that the at least so far the you know, standard monetary policy measures have worked, and this is a, is a bit the same with what we argue here at ECB that that we have tools beyond uh, you know the zero bound. Uh, hopefully we are right. So, so how, I mean, it's a bit in contradiction. So either we say that, uh, that, that monetary policy has lost potency and therefore we need more fiscal support or not, and the, I think the, the issue is not, is not uh, clear. And also another aspect of it, I think, is that uh, you know, just mechanically, and, and, you know, a larger fiscal response at zero bound coupled with, uh, with quantitative easing is basically helicopter money. It's, it's the same as helicopter money. So you have basically monetary expansion and, and a parallel fiscal expansion. 
So basically what we are advocating is a bit of a helicopter money, uh, a conditional helicopter money done at a zero bound. Uh, can get this out of control or maybe not reverse later? Uh, so these are all questions that, uh, that are important as well. But uh, you have a lot to cover, so. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, well, let, let me a answer Linda's factual question first. Um, this is, um, brings to mind the old joke about economists trying to open a can. And the economist says, let's assume we have a can opener. Um, and that's, uh, we're basically assuming that something that's probably unconstitutional is constitutional. Um, it's um, it's, it's a, an aspiration. Um, and I guess you could say that since nobody expects any of these uh, proposals to be enacted anyway, it doesn't matter whether it's constitutional or not. Um, the, um, um, the, the, it's an interesting question about uh, if, you know, if, if we have un, these unfunded liabilities and we, and we have a zero rate of return, then uh, it, it's much more difficult to fund. We still can, it just we have to put a lot more aside. Um, so I wouldn't say that funding can't, can't be done. It, it's just that uh, we need more money. But I also, as I suggested, I think there are other approaches. There, uh, you can have um, pension benefits that are perfectly stable if they're indexed to wage growth uh, and, um, and the old age dependency ratio. Um, you, you can make an unfunded system uh, completely st uh, stable, uh, doesn't require any intervention, doesn't require any funding. You may not like the, uh, the distributional consequences across different cohorts. It, it may not work exactly the way you want. I, in my view, there's probably some optimal mix of funding and, in, and indexing. Um, I think that uh, that's something I've actually worked on myself in a couple of papers, um, and, I, and I think that's something that people should think about more. It, it depends, obviously, very much on on uh, individual country uh, circumstances, um, uh, both in terms of productivity growth, the uncertainty of productivity growth, the the age structure, and and how rapidly the uh, the, the society is aging. Um, Will we all look like Japan? Will we have uh, fiscal crises? Um, your question about helicopter money and, and whether uh, uh, we'll, we'll get out of, things will get out of control. It's, it's sort of, um, I feel a little bit schizophrenic to, to, be, saying, to be discussing a, a situation in which on the one hand, uh, central banks are unable to bring uh, inflation up to inflation targets and at the same time, we're worrying about the fiscal theory of the price level, um, which says that irresponsible fiscal policy is going to lead to a jump in prices. Um, somehow, they don't seem to be both possible uh, at the same time. Uh, or maybe the idea is that w w one will be true and then the other will be true. Um, that kind of reminds me of the approach that the Bank of Japan took uh, during the dismal years in Japan, when the Bank of Japan remained cautious because they were worried that um, uh, large uh, expansions of the monetary base, even though they would, appeared to be having no effect, would suddenly have an effect, and then it would be very difficult to control. Um, I don't, um, you know, maybe, maybe it's just because of my orientation toward thinking about fiscal policy rather than monetary policy, um, but I, I do worry about the infeasible of, uh, infeasibility of fiscal policy. Let me also point out, um, the, the whole idea of the fiscal theory of the price level is that if you have a uh, unsustainable fiscal policy, uh, the price level will adjust to make it sustainable. Um, that's not true in the, when you're talking about future liabilities. So when I showed you this picture and I said, well, what happens, uh, you know, how much of the, the fiscal gaps that countries face uh, are attributable to current debt and how much of it is attributable to future primary deficits associated with uh, old age spending, a big chunk of it's the latter. Um, when we think about what the fiscal theory of the price level uh, tells us, it tells us that if you have a lot of nominal liabilities that make your fiscal policy unsustainable, a jump in the price level can bring the government's intertemporal budget constraint back into balance. That's not true if you have future liabilities and the liabilities are real rather than nominal. Uh, that is, if you've promised to provide a certain standard of living 
or a certain uh, quality and amount of health care, and the price level doubles, your liabilities haven't changed. Um, your, your, the real value of your existing liabilities have gone down. But as I showed you, if I made the government debt go away, you've still got very large fiscal gaps. And so the fiscal theory of the price level, whether it will prove true or not in terms of its impact on the price level, it's not going to solve our fiscal problems. Okay, so thanks a lot for, for this really enlightening. I, I think we should have another round of applause. <laughs> so let's, let's hope we survive a fiscal crisis, but meanwhile, let's have a coffee break.